I work at the Weisskopf Child Evaluation Center, and I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician there, and um, we do multidisciplinary team evaluations for children with a variety of developmental disabilities, including autism spectrum disorders. This is probably one of our biggest referral questions uh, coming up. We have psychologists, we have speech language pathologists, we have an occupational therapist, and we have a social worker. And we see kids from throughout the state of Kentucky, all ages, all it takes is a referral from their physician in order to get them seen. We are primarily diagnostic in nature. Um, we see children sometimes only one time. Sometimes we see them in follow-up. Sometimes we see them for medication management purposes. Um, but most of the time we see our job as trying to get a clear picture of that child and um, pointing them in the direction of resources in their community. Um, so that's what we do. There, we also have an autism center, which was um, in a building, was actually uh, uh, in a building since 2010. And I work there one day a week doing medical consultation. And they provide speech, OT, um, social skills group, behavioral intervention, um, a variety of services. And they're in the same building as a facility called the Kentucky Autism Training Center, which provides training throughout the state to schools and to uh, parent groups and so on. Um, so that's kind of our setup. I will say we're trying to do more outreach now. We have outreach clinics to the western part of Kentucky and to the eastern part of Kentucky, providing both treatment and diagnosis as well. But today I was planning on just giving you a little bit of inter information about autism spectrum disorders. And if um, you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to ask. So these are some of the topics that we're going to be talking about. And I think one of the very controversial issues with autism is this change in prevalence over the last 20 to 30 years. When I first started doing this about 20 some odd years ago, we were quoting a prevalence rate of four to five per 10,000 kids with ASD. And that rate has changed dramatically now. Currently, the CDC says one in 68 uh, children, eight-year-olds in the United States, will have a diagnosis of an autism spectrum. So what accounts for that? I think without a doubt, um, part of it is that we've got this broader definition, that we've got better tools to diagnose these youngsters, and that gives uh, clinicians more confidence in making the diagnosis. I think that we're also probably diagnosing more individuals both at the upper end of the spectrum where they might have just been called kind of quirky or nerdy before. Now they're getting a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder. And the same at the lower end of the spectrum where they have some degree of intellectual disability and may now be getting a diagnosis of both ASD and intellectual disability. Um, so all that, oh, and I think one other reason is, we were talking about this at lunch, is that um, we've got increasing... In oh, Curtis, sorry. can you mute, please? Sorry. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so we've got increased resources, and some families actually come seeking a diagnosis because they feel that it will give their child the appropriate uh, resources. I personally feel that there is a true increase in the prevalence as well. And we'll kind of touch on this a little bit later on, but some of the environmental factors that may play a role in autism spectrum disorders may account for this increased uh, prevalence over, over time. Regardless, we're going to see more and more of these kids and they're going to need more and more resources. Just starting with the definition. Uh, it's a developmental disability that's characterized by severe impairments in social communication skills and a markedly restricted or repetitive uh, range of activities and interests. Back in the DSM-4 several years ago, the DSM-5 came out in 2013, we had this broad range or umbrella term called pervasive developmental disorder. And under that, we had a number of categories, autism being the most common and the most commonly um, uh, diagnosed. 
There was Asperger's disorder, where you had to have at least average intelligence and no significant impairment in your language milestones. And this other category called PDD-NOS, or pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, where you had some but not all the characteristics of autism. And we had three levels, three areas of impairment. Social interaction was one, communication was the other, and then the limited range of interests and activities. Well, they did away with the whole PDD um, uh, umbrella, and now everything is included under autism spectrum disorder. The reason being that um, the, the people who wrote the DSM-5 felt that um, we're pretty good at telling kids on versus not on the spectrum, but not so good at that subcategorization. Another change was that the social and communication categories were combined. To my way of thinking, that made sense. Language impairments are certainly part of ASD, um, but it's many kids with, early on with ASD have language. They say phrases or repeat dialogue from movies, but they're not using that in a functional communication setting. So the social communication combination really makes sense, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here too. The symptoms must be present from early childhood, but that's with a caveat, um, because there are some kids, especially higher functioning kids, who initially may show some joint attention or shared enjoyment, and it may not be until they're in elementary school that the social demands become more, become greater, and you notice the discrepancy between their other developmental skills and those social communication skills. So they were there early, but they weren't picked up on necessarily until a later age. And then the severity level is um, uh, accessed by uh, noting the number of supports that are needed. Okay. So everybody knows that autism is a spectrum disorder and um, that no two individuals with ASD are going to present in exactly the same way. In fact, there's a phrase you probably heard before, once you met one child with autism, you met one child with autism. There is no um, overriding picture that you see. Um, and you're going to see variable prognosis dependent on a lot of different factors. Nonetheless, one of the first questions that parents will ask us when we newly diagnose a child is, where do you think he is on the spectrum? And usually what we wind up saying is, we know he meets criteria, but there's so many issues that may play a role in outcome that it usually is helpful to see that child down the road. We have baseline data now, we see the child back in a couple of years, and we get a better picture of that progress. Um, kids with Average to above average intelligence generally do better. Um, kids maybe with a more uh, pliable temperament often do better. Certainly intensive early intervention plays a role as well. One area where I think we've made a lot of progress is in early identification. And part of the reason for this, I think, is because of the American Academy of Pediatric Recommendations for autism-specific screening at both 18 and 24 months of age. So the usual screening tool that's used is the MCHAT, the Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers. And that's a 22-item um, list that parents fill out. It has certain critical items on it, um, but uh, it is a nicely sensitive and specific tool, especially when used in combination with follow-up phone call about the critical items. There was also a campaign that was, uh, it's called uh, Learn the Signs, Act Early, and it was started by the CDC, the AAP, and a number of autism support groups to get pamphlets out there, and those are available to anyone. You can uh, contact them and get pamphlets for the office or whatever, just giving certain red flags that might, in, uh, might cue that a child might be at risk for an autism spectrum disorder. That's a copy of the MCHAT. It's available online, free of charge, and it's really a nice tool to use. Okay, so how do we make the diagnosis? It is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, you know, up to this point, we don't have any specific tests, although obviously there are a lot of people working on tests, medical tests, genetic tests, which might um, 
give us an, um, uh, a heads up on the diagnosis. But we base it, our um, clinical diagnosis on the history that the parents give us, on our observations of the child. There are also some tools that may be helpful. The gold standard is generally considered the ADIR, the autism, I'm sorry, the ADOS, the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. And that is a uh, tool that requires specific training. It sets up structured play schema and then the child is scored on whether he uh, um, replies or uh, responds to certain um, social uh, 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 social uh, overtures and to, as to whether he meets criteria or not. It gives a score. It's not the be-all and end-all. It should be used in conjunction with your clinical observations, but it is a very helpful tool. We do multidisciplinary team evaluations because we feel that it's helpful to see that child in the context of his other developmental skills. In general, the social communication skills should be much more impaired than other developmental areas in order to make the diagnosis. So I'm just going to briefly go over how these youngsters present um, at an early age, and again, um, there's high individual variation, but these are some of the common features that you might often see. And one is poor response to name. And it's not because the child's not hearing. Usually by the time they've gotten to us, they've had their hearing tested. We know they're hearing. Parents will tell you they're hearing. They're hearing the refrigerator door open or whatever. But they don't respond to their name. Why not? Because when you call somebody's name, you're attempting to engage that individual, right? That's the way that we uh, connect with others. And these kids don't get that in an early age. So they, you can call their names six or seven times before you get any acknowledgement of a response. Generally, they have um, very much difficulty with both receptive and expressive language. And most kids who have language impairments usually understand more than they're able to express. Sometimes it's the opposite with these kids. They may come out with long strings of dialogue or repeated echolalia or whatever, but it's not in a functional or meaningful way. Um, and often they are not understanding the most basic of uh, uh, instructions. The thing that sets these youngsters apart in an early age from kids who have language impairments for other reasons such as intellectual disability or hearing impairment or just a developmental language disorder is their lack of nonverbal communication. You know, you've seen kids that don't say words, but they're sure getting their message across. They're looking at you, they're making all kinds of facial expression, they're pointing, they're gesturing, they're getting their message across to you nonverbally. Not so with these youngsters. Often they have kind of flat facial expression. Not that they don't laugh when they're tickled and stuff like that, but in general, not a great range of facial expression. They're often impaired as far as their use of eye gaze. They don't point till much, much later than you expect. Most kids start pointing around 10 to 12 months of age to request and also to show. Not these kids. It may be much uh, later. And when you ask families, well, how does he let you know what he wants? Usually you get the response, well, he really doesn't. I have to guess. Sometimes they'll say they'll pull the family, the mom by the hand or put the mom's hand on something um, or pulls the refrigerator and then starts crying and mom doesn't know what he wants in the refrigerator. So that lack of nonverbal communication is really um, very prominent in these young children with autism. And in about a third of cases, you get a history of language regression, where the family will say, well, you know, he seemed to be doing OK. He was saying a couple words at a year of age, and um, we thought everything was on track. And then usually the time frame is about 18 to 22 months of age, when the, they will notice either a loss of those words or no additional progression. The child seems less social. Nobody knows what causes that. Um, I think parents come up with their own uh, theories. I've heard 
Um, well, that's when he started having ear infections, or that's when mom back went back to work, or that's when baby brother was born, or that's when he got his vaccinations. There are all kinds of theories, but nobody knows what causes that, but it is a true phenomenon in um, ASD. Now, the general pr uh, uh, path is progression, and some kids progress very quickly. They start using words and sentences, they start talking, but even in the highest functioning individuals, you usually have some deficit still, still obvious in their use of pragmatic or social communication. So carrying on a conversation, picking up on listener cues, sarcasm, taking things literally, those are all things that many kids still have difficulty with even as they move along. <clears throat> Other issues are, um, we often hear the term on his own agenda. We used to hear off in his own little world. Child's very content to do his own thing at an early age. And you think about most to toddlers you know, they're constantly in your face trying to get your attention, wanting you to look at things they're doing, um, looking for your reaction to things. Not these kids. They're very content to go about their way. If you're there, that's okay. If you're not there, that's okay too. Um, but what we often see is this lack of joint attention and shared enjoyment. So they may bring you something they need help with, but not just to show you and say, hey, look at this. Isn't this cool? You know, that's not what they are doing, and they just don't get this in an early age. And those deficits are most often apparent with same age peers. We were talking about this at lunch too. You know, adults work pretty hard to get kids engaged. You know, they're really trying to get kids um, uh, to, on the same page. Not so with same age peers. They just, if you're not there right off the bat, they just go off on their own. And these kids go off on their own too. A lot of times you'll hear that they push other kids away. They're the ones that don't join in circle time. They're off on their own, again, kind of doing their own thing. And that changes over time, too. I had one um, parent of a, of a teenager tell me, um, yeah, he's starting to get interested in, in girls, but I'm a little concerned about it. She said they were in a doctor's office. He saw a cute girl across the way, and he went over, and he, he said, hi, my name's Bill. What's your name? And she said, my name's Melanie. And he said, can I kiss you? Um, you know, he, he was initiating. He just didn't <laughs> get the whole process that goes in between times. So, um, you know, again, that, that gap is sometimes apparent. So, um, this second category is what is often most observably different in kids with autism, and yet it's probably the least reliable in making the diagnosis because many kids with intellectual disability show some of these same things, or even kids that are on the very anxious side will show some of these things. So at an early age, you get this history of often minimal or different toy play. Um, so not so you hear stories. Um, in fact, to another question, I usually ask, well, what does he like to do? How does he spend his time? And sometimes parents will go, well, he's got a whole room full of toys, but he'd much rather dangle a uh, string or flush the toilet over and over again or that kind of thing. Or they'll say, yeah, he plays with toys, but when you ask how, it's lining toys up or arranging by size or color or looking at parts of toys, spinning the wheels on the car. Lots of perseverative activities. And all kids have repetitive activities, right? They like to do things over and over. But these kids may do things over and over for hours at a time, on and off lights, opening and closing doors, running back and forth in a pattern. There are certainly a lot of motor stereotypes that go along with ASD too. A lot of flapping and flicking and spinning and so on. Many times you'll get a history of lack of pretend play. And most kids start pretend play about three or four years of age. They're playing house, they're pretending they're a fireman or whatever. These kids may imitate what they've seen on TV, but not spontaneous uh, pretend play. And then sometimes you get these very strong preoccupations. And in my experience, it can be anything. It could be um, uh, trees, Thomas the Train, um, construction equipment, the planets, whatever. But kids find out all about that, and that's really all they want to talk about. You know, can't carry on a how's the weather today. It has to go back to this one topic. And certainly, uh, there is this insistence on routine and rituals. The way I kind of put it together, if I were a youngster with ASD 
and really couldn't communicate very effectively and didn't get the social back and forth. I want my environment to be controlled. I want no surprises, no change in my day. And I think that's the way they are. A change in the route to school, a substitute teacher, changing something in the child's room can really tremendously impact these youngsters. They have meltdowns, they have a, a, a terrible time with it. And also in this category is this abnormal response to sensory input. So many kids have sensory integration issues or um, those sensory processing difficulties, however you want to put it. These kids almost always have a combination of both sensory seeking and sensory defensiveness. So they love rough housing and wrestling, but they hate light touch or sticky stuff, something like that. They may be cover their ears to loud, unexpected sounds, but they love certain types of music. And they often engage what we call unusual visual inspection, looking at things from different angles, looking up at the ceiling, um, those types of things. Okay. Any questions just about that little part? Okay. Let's talk just a little bit about the epidemiology of ASD. And like so many other developmental disorders, ASD has a male predominance. It's a male to female predominance of four to one for ASD. You have about a 50% incidence of intellectual disability, and seizures are going to occur up to a third of youngsters with ASD. Further support of the neurobiologic basis of ASD comes from the fact that we can identify medical and genetic conditions in about 10 to 15 percent of cases. And you all know this a lot better than I, but um, the, the list of conditions that have been associated with ASD are just, it's just a huge list. Um, and um, interesting, we were talking about the, the metabolic case today. Before PKU was um, identified in the through newborn screenings, a lot of those kids, as they uh, deteriorated neurologically, presented with findings consistent with an autism spectrum disorder. Back in the 60s, when there was a rubella epidemic, moms who had rubella during pregnancy often had kids not only with multi-organ system uh, involvement, but also with ASD. So these are just, a, of course, this is fragile X. That's a very strong association. Even though those boys may not have classic autism, they have social skill deficits and ADHD and poor eye contact. Of course, Rett syndrome is another one. Um, that history is a little bit different as far as the deterioration skills, but most of those girls look to have um, uh, ASD features as well. TS is a really strong association. It's estimated that up to 60% of individuals with tuberous sclerosis, particularly the ones who have seizures and intellectual disability, also meet criteria for ASD. And there is a subset of kids with Down syndrome, about 10%, who also meet criteria for ASD. And even though social skills are a strength for most kids, there is that subset. Phenobalproate syndrome. Um, so bones who took Depakote during pregnancy not only had kids who may have had some facial differences and so on, but also met criteria for ASD. Okay, so um, I beefed this part up, but I think you all probably know a bit more about this than I do, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. Suffice it to say that the more uh, studies that are done with ASD, I think the more complex the etiology becomes. Um, when uh, studies were first started, you know, it was at, or, uh, looking at different structures of the brain associated with ASD, you know, it was thought that there were different areas of the brain that uh, would be implicated. And indeed, there have been some studies that have shown um, some variations now. Now we've moved on to different types of uh, either functional MRI or some of the PET studies. and. I think it still is a very, very confusing area. Um, those are some of the, you know, the uh, spectrometry, spectrometry studies that have been done. When I looked at the, the uh, compilation of data um, associated with these brain differences, um, I think everybody agrees that there is rapid brain growth in kids with ASD from uh, infancy up into um, preschool to school age, and then it kind of levels off. 
Um, about a fourth of youngsters will have macrocephaly and meet criteria for macrocephaly. And that seems to be accounted for um, by both increased gray matter and white matter in the frontal and temporal lobes in young children. Um, other findings that are fairly consistent are that many kids with ASD have a larger hippocampus, amygdala, and caudate, but a smaller corpus callosum. Interestingly enough, there have been several studies that have come out recently that show when they look at adult brains, these differences have really, really um, uh, decreased, that they're not as prominent, that they're not seeing these differences. So it seems to be some um, uh, uh, differences in early childhood, and that's certainly when the rapid growth in brain size occurs, and then kind of plateaus and is not so prominent uh, with, with later age. There are also studies that look at con connectivities in different parts of the brain in kids with ASD. And again, these have been conflicting results, but I think a lot of it shows that um, there are reduced long-range connectivities between brain regions, but maybe increased um, short-range connectivities. So that, and then they have also found some differences in certain um, uh, chemical substances such as uh, creatinine, choline, and glutamate. Um, some of the PET studies have suggested decreased flow, blood flow to the temporal lobes. As far as the genetic predisposition, predisposition, I just find this so interesting. You know, I can remember again reading studies on this uh, 20 years ago, and we were talking about a largely genetic etiology of ASD, probably of 90%, and there were studies that showed a concordance rate in monozygotic twins of 90%, or it was 10 to 20% in dizygotic twins. The more recent literature, and I'm sure you're well aware of this, is showing that we, it's probably just about 50% uh, genetic. You know, that there are a number of environmental factors that are likely playing a role in this. Um, and these are some of the statistics that uh, are used. Um, again, it, it, it kind of shows that the uh, genetic load for females has to be greater than it is for males. Um, especially um, uh, when you consider um, the incidence of intellectual disability there. So these are some of the research approaches that are currently being used, and I think you're probably familiar with all of those. Um, as far as genetic variation, obviously, uh, I was just talking to Dr. Stevenson about that. You know, when we first started out, we thought, oh, 10 to 20 genes that may be implicated. Now we're talking over 800 genes implicated in ASD. And, um, you know, they're finding some interesting uh, um, studies that show that um, even though they can't identify um, individual SNPs that are, are uh, uh, seen with ASD, there does seem to be this additive effect of increased number of these. Obviously, you're very familiar with the number of the deletions and duplications that are um, implicated, and there seems to be evidence that um, there are excess copy number variants in ASD, especially those that occur de novo and that are homozygous. Okay, and that's what I was talking about as far as um, you know, you hear both ways, that it's a, um, a, a male vulnerability or a female protective effect in ASD. Um, but certainly when you look at um, the male to female ratio, particularly in kids who don't have cognitive impairment, it is quite high um, uh, for males compared to females. Um, they've also found studies that have shown that um, uh, females with ASD do have more copy number variants and that these are of the penetrant, higher penetrant and pathogenic types. And they've also um, noted that many of the uh, X chromosome genes do involve both ASD and intellectual disability. So I think, you know, some of the, um, the, the kind of fascination is to look not only at the individual genes, but what those genes do. And um, 
uh, for the most part, these are, this is kind of a summary of what a lot of the genes involved with ASD are, um, uh, what their purpose is. Um, and I've only put out one uh, example, but there are usually several genes that have been identified uh, connected with ASD um, that uh, are also seen in addition to this. Um, but certainly a lot of um, neural connective uh, genes um, and uh, involved in cell growth and synaptic organization. So what are some of the environmental factors that play a role in ASD? Um, certainly there are studies that have implicated both advanced maternal and paternal age. Um, spacing between births has also been in, implicated. Um, a number of pregnancy-related complications, um, these are just a few of them. We already talked about medications during pregnancy. Um, I think Devacote is a uh, very clear-cut I think the SSRIs are not quite as clear-cut. I saw a recent study that said it may not be the fact that mom was using the SSRIs, but more the, 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 the depression and anxiety that mom may have that led to the SSRI use during pregnancy that might play a role. So these are some others. Uh, delivery complications, a few more of those, poor feeding in the newborn period. Um, certainly folate deficiency and vitamin D deficiency have also been implicated. Um, interestingly enough, there's at least one study that shows that maternal immigration um, is associated with recently immigrated uh, mothers have a higher risk uh, of having a child with ASD. And maybe that has to do in part with maternal stress during pregnancy, which has really not been looked at well, but which is uh, um, uh, viewed as a potential um, environmental factor. Immunologic uh, factors, there have been a lot of emphasis in trying to find uh, immunologic factors that play a role in ASD. And again, I think these, these studies overall have been small and relatively confusing as far as um, having varying findings. But certainly you do have a history of increased autoimmune disease in families with ASD. There's a lot of in, uh, information about maternal immune activation, moms who had infection during pregnancy, and maternal autoantibodies to certain brain proteins um, have been another area. Um, and there have been findings that have shown uh, T-cell response differences in kids with ASD compared to controls. I think this is a fascinating area that we're probably just on the um, verge of finding out more about, but you know some of the um, syndromes which involve uh, methylation differences, um, such as Rett and Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, a lot of the ASD implicated genes are involved in methylation, so those are a few of the ones that are currently being uh, looked into. And then again, what immune pathways? can activate these and cause these epigenetic uh, changes over time. I can't really read that, but I found that in a recent paper by Yin that looked at um, uh, epigenetic factors in autism, and it is kind of interesting how it call, uh, kind of all intertwines. Okay, now we get back to the clinical aspect that I feel most comfortable with. So <laughs> as far as the medical workup, uh, you know, we, uh, I, as I said, get a detailed history. Most of the time on physical examination, for the vast majority of kids with ASD, we do not find dysmorphic features. We always look, but uh, again, the vast majority do not have those. But that's uh, one of the things that we look for, of course, is growth parameters, given the fact that up to a quarter of kids have um, macrocephaly. Um, that's important for us to look for. Skin finding, some of the neurocutaneous disorders like NF1 has an association with ASD, um, tuber sclerosis, as we were uh, talking about. Um, neurologic exam usually is not markedly different with these kids. You often get a little bit of lower muscle tone, a little bit of looseness or flexibility. Often they're late in establishing a hand dominance. And many of them engage in toe walking, not because of spasticity, but apparently because of the sensory input that toe walking provides for these youngsters. Obviously you want to have a hearing evaluation if you can't get it. Um, through routine screening, doing an ABR or something of that sort, and an ophthalmologic evaluation. 
And our routine workup has been clinically to recommend uh, chromosome microarray and fragile X DNA study with some of the kids, particularly if they have macrocephaly or they have significant cognitive impairment, I will get an MRI of the brain. I'll just skip through these. Um, now just to talk about a few of the health issues in ASD. I'm still okay. Um, certainly uh, some of the things that we run into clinically are um, issues with eating. Many kids are picky eaters, but kids with ASD often take this to an extreme where they're only eating one or two foods. And it can't be just any McNuggets. It has to be McDonald's McNuggets. And they make trips to the McDonald's every day in order to get those. Um, and I think in part, it's, it's maybe based in part on texture or smell or whatever. But again, I think it's that insistence on sameness. They're comfortable with this certain food repertoire, and that's all they're going to do. So there are feeding teams that work on expanding uh, food repertoire. And, and there's a nice website if you uh, want to reference it, feedingmatters.org, and it has some suggestions for introducing new foods and ways of building up to trying new foods in a very positive fashion, not forcing. Sleep problems, of course, are very significant with kids with ASD, and there seems to be quite a bit of evidence that there are differences in circadian rhythms for kids with ASD. Um, and they often have difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, um, waking up during the night. Um, so it's particularly important for these kids to have um, a very set uh, bedtime routine, maybe using visual schedules to let them know what the next step in the routine is. Um, if sleep hygiene alone does not work, and I will say the Autism Speaks website has a really nice toolkit for sleep on, uh, uh, for ASD, so that's a nice resource. Um, then melatonin is usually the first line, and nice research supporting the use of melatonin in these kids. Certainly you get a lot of GI complaints too, stomach aches, constipation, um, diarrhea, and I think the big push there has been not just to attribute those differences to the child's diet, but to actually investigate and be sure that there is nothing going on. Certainly a lot of these kids do seem to have functional constipation. Seizures, again, we talked about um, up to a third of kids have seizures, up to 50% have abnormal EEGs. There are two peaks of new onset seizures in ASD. One is in infancy, and that's infantile spasms. The second is in adolescence, and that can be any kind of a seizure disorder. Vaccinations, it, it comes up still, um, and uh, you know, I think that it probably in part had to do with that timing of the uh, regression for some kids. Um, first it was the measles vaccine, and I think um, we feel pretty comfortable saying that the compilation of data that's now available to us uh, internationally does not support a, 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 an association between ASD and the measles vaccine. The second one was the thimerosal that was in some of the vaccines like hepatitis B. And while that data is not as extensive, uh, what is available does not support an association. And that uh, preservative has been out of vaccines for the most part since 2001, and yet we still see the um, prevalence increase. Okay, so what do we, how do we treat ASD? And um, it is primarily uh, educational and behavioral. We now have uh, 27 evidence-based practices which have been found to be helpful um, with treatment of ASD. And as you look at this list, it's, it's fairly broad. Um, most kids with ASD learn better visually than they do auditorily. So the use of picture schedules and um, the picture exchange communication system, uh, using pictures to get what you want, um, is uh, very effective with many kids, especially in that early stage of learning communication. Um, many of the uh, interventions are very um, behaviorally oriented. They shape behaviors that are uh, desired and help fade behaviors that are undesired. Um, other things include such things as uh, um, uh, when we talk about visual sports, video modeling, social skills groups, those are all things which have been found to be helpful. 
just because they're on this list doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be uh, working for each child. You have to individualize the program to be sure that you've got a combination that is um, effective for that individual child. This is supposed to be an example of applied behavior analysis, which again is a very intensive um, behavior shaping program, one-on-one, -on -one. and that's where a lot of the studies are looking at um, early intervention have found a significant benefit. Unfortunately, most families cannot um, afford or have available to them 20 to 40 hours of intervention per week that those studies were based on. This is supposed to be an example of TEACH, Training and Education of Autism and Other Communication Impaired Children. And this was, uh, came out of North Carolina, um, uh, setting up visual supports and, and visuals in the environment to help a child be successful. That's supposed to be an example of the picture exchange communication system, which starts our very basic, giving a picture for some very desired object or activity. This is an example of floor time, and we have a lot of variants on this one called More Than Words from Hannon, where um, parents set up uh, opportunities for that child to need to communicate um, and based on the child's interests and activities. I'll very briefly touch on uh, medications. This is probably not an area that you all are particularly interested in. Obviously, we don't have any medicines that um, treat core symptoms of ASD, but we do have medicines that can be helpful in treating um, comorbidities. And many of the kids with ASD do have comorbidities such as ADHD, attention and impulse control difficulties. Used to be we couldn't even diagnose that separately from ASD because it was just thought to be part of the whole picture. But now with the DSM-5, we can diagnose that separately. I will say you use the basically the same medications, but you don't have as uniform a response to stimulant medications that you use in straightforward <coughs> ADHD in kids with ASD and ADHD. It often causes more agitation or irritability, so you have to be kind of careful there and often use non-stimulant medications. Depression, aggression, and mood liability. This is an area that I think we've made some progress. Um, there are now two FDA-approved atypical antipsychotics used to treat severe irritability associated with a a ASD, and that is um, aripiprazole or Abilify and risperidone or risperdal. Now, those are medicines that have significant side effects. They can cause dystonic movements. They can cause weight gain. They've been associated sometimes with uh, um, uh, with uh, high blood glucose levels, weight gain, uh, sedation, and so on. You have to warn about that. But sometimes those are the only medications that allow a child to stay in the home uh, that might otherwise be hospitalized. And certainly many kids have anxiety and depression. Again, probably using the same medicines, the SSRIs and those types of things. But again, not as uniformly effective or as well tolerated. Um, so you have to warn parents about increased agitation or uh, negative mood when you start those as a possible side effect. <coughs> Melatonin is first line. There are some other medications that can be used primarily for sleep onset, not maintenance of sleep. There is an extended release form of melatonin as well as a short acting. Sometimes I'll use those in combination if they've got both sleep onset and sleep maintenance problems. Um, other medicines, clonidine, which is used for ADHD symptoms, has a fairly strong sedative side effect and can be used, as well as some of the antidepressants like trazodone and uh, mirtazapine. We run into all kinds of alternative biologic interventions, and, um, and I'm sure this is very, very small sampling. There are new ones every day, and there are new ones that parents tell me about that I'm not familiar with. Um, I think the important thing to recognize here is that unfortunately there's not enough research either to support or refute most of these interventions. For as long as the casein gluten-free diet has been around, there are only two small studies, one of which showed some behavioral improvement with the diet. Um, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge uh, with the family uh, and to find out as much as you can about that intervention, whether there's any research supporting it, and then look at it in the context of the child's other um, interventions and see uh, you know, how much 
this is going to cost, what resources uh, do we have to take away from something else to do this. If it's not harmful like the casein and gluten-free diet, I usually encourage parents to do their own two or three month um, mini trials to see if they think it benefits. It's a little bit expensive and time consuming, but if it works and it helps digest the problems, that makes sense. Others, like the oral chelation, I, I think there's no good support of heavy metal uh, toxicity in, in these youngsters, and that is potentially um, life-threatening intervention, so I would certainly discourage uh, both families from that. Okay, and this is just some of the guidelines. Again, I think it's important to talk to families, not just to blow it off and say, oh, that's ridiculous or whatever, because let's face it, we don't have that many interventions that are evidence-based and that really have a lot of research support. So um, I think it's important to be open. These are a few of our resources, and I think I told you about the Autism Center and um, the Weisskopf Child Evaluation Center, just as you have here, we rely on the public school system and our zero to three early intervention system. Um, we have a, a family guide. I suspect you all have uh, very similar things. I find these to be helpful resources as I um, uh, do research. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a nice toolkit on autism. I love Autism Speaks. They've got a 100-day toolkit for families that is extremely helpful, as well as toolkits on a variety of topics such as, uh, we mentioned sleep, they've got toileting, they've got blood draws, they've got all kinds of uh, really nice information. And then the Center for Disease Control has a, nice, a lot of nice information, I think, for residents as far as case-based um, instances as to how to um, broach the subject of an autism spectrum disorder. Okay. Oh boy, I did fly through that, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> In conclusion, you know, it's, it's common. We're going to see more and more of it. And um, I think that if we recognize it earlier, we've got a much better uh, chance of uh, uh, giving parents guidance and uh, pointing at them in the right direction and getting that child off to a good start. Obviously, it's, it's neurobiologic. I think we're finding out more and more about both the genetic and the environmental origins of it. I would like to see us not only looking at etiology, but it also treatment options, because I think we have so little research and we have so little guidance for families as to what is really going to work. And I think that's why families so often go toward alternative interventions, uh, uh, because unfortunately we don't have um, um, the tools to give them right from the get-go. So that is it, and I hope you have questions. <laughs>